Hey there, bookworms! Ready for another chapter in the whimsical Gretchen's Misadventures series? You're in for a royal treat! Today, we're diving into the charming world of A Royal Froggy Problem, episode 3 in the enchanting series by P.A. Mason. In this magical tale, join us as we follow Gretchen on another misadventure, where royal antics and political intrigue await. So grab your crown, a witch's brew, and let's unravel the enchantment of a royal froggy problem. Chapter One I can't believe I agreed to this. There's no way a toad will mistake us for a pair of sitting ducks. Gretchen flicked the plumes tied to her pointed hat. Hush, Nora snatched her hand to stillness. If we stand any chance of catching it, you need to shut your trap. Gretchen ground her teeth and drew a sharp breath through her nose. They'd been lying in the stinking muck for hours. If there was a giant toad hiding in the barren's parklands, she'd wager it was further into the reedy marsh. Nora tilted the small mirror to flick a light across the water, and Gretchen suppressed a groan. Where did you hear about that anyhow? Those slimy things spend most of their time hiding from the sun. The murky water lurched, and a brown shape disrupted the surface. Gotcha! Nora sprang forward in an undignified splash, raking hands through the fanning ripples. The water by Gretchen's knees stirred, and she snatched the slimy creature from the sticky, muddy mess at her submerged feet. She held it aloft, victorious, and shrieked as it wriggled in her grasp. Nora rolled over in the mire, her eyes widening at a spot behind Gretchen. And what have we here? Gretchen turned with her squirming quarry to stare at the master of the hunt sitting astride his sleek horse. You know it's a grievous crime to pilfer from the baron's lands. His mouth twisted in a contemptuous grimace. It's a toad. Gretchen lifted her chin. I doubt the baron wants its legs for his breakfast. The baron cares for all the creatures under his wardship. Tell that to the deer, Gretchen muttered. Nora splashed out of the water and stood by the horse with her hands on her hips. Here, now. As part of his lordship's household, I have the right. Hand over the toad. He held out a gauntleted hand and rolled his eyes. Gretchen's eyes flickered to Nora, and she swallowed. Wading out of the mud, she squeezed the toad's belly, and as she held it up to the master of the hunt, a wet gurgle erupted over his boots. Filthy creature, he hissed, recoiling. Toss it back into that swamp, or I'll lock you both in the dungeons. Gretchen schooled her face to calm, and tossed the toad over her shoulder with a wet splash. We witches have a civil duty, you see. Can't have a toad with a bellyache on the baron's lands. Not that your sort cares for such lowly creatures, but even the smallest. The master of the hunt turned his horse and launched off, bending to wipe the muck off his boot. Nora scrambled in his wake to sift through the sticky mess on the ground and held a small stone to the light, grinning. A fair-sized toadstone, if I do say so myself. So should we split the proceeds with the baron? Ha! Nora waved an arm. If he wants one, he can come catch one himself. Gretchen reached to squeeze water from her skirts and wrinkled her nose at the smell. Well, I'm glad I brought a spare pair of clothes at least. Any chance of a hot meal from the kitchens? I'm half starved after all that. Didn't even get a bite for breakfast after you stomped into my place so early. You're doing a lot of complaining for someone who just got a decent payday, Nora snorted, tucking the toadstone into her pouch. Cook will have something lying around. The pair trudged together toward the back of the estate house, where Nora's workroom lay situated by the dungeons. After changing into clean clothes, Nora led the way up into the house, past servants scuttling around in a frenzy. What's up with those guys? Anyone would think you have the king himself in residence, Gretchen said. Nora frowned as a maid rushed past with arms loaded with sheets. If he is, it's news to me. As far as I knew... The Baron planned on spending the week in his saddle after hearing whispers about a particularly cantankerous boar in the woodlands. They strode into the kitchens, where shouts and curses followed on the tales of well-groomed lads carrying silver trays. Well, I doubt they're catering for the boar. Nora frowned as she rounded the corner and stopped short. A tall man with steel-grey hair and impressive eyebrows glowered at the pair over the cook's work table. And where have you been, Nora? The Baron has been asking after you for an hour. Gretchen took a sidestep to escape the crossfire, and Nora glared back at the fussy man. Where I've been is none of your concern, steward. 
Now what has this house scrambling like a dog with fleas? An unexpected visit from the Prince of Sharon himself, Stuart snapped, accusing the Baron of placing a hex on him. Nora blinked, and her brows furrowed as she considered Stuart's words. Gretchen covertly snatched a slice of cheese from a tray and popped it in her mouth. I never... Of course you didn't. That's the point. But the Prince's people will have none of it and are threatening to cut trade ties with the region. Nora's eyes darted, and she took a deep breath. Where is he? In the drawing room. The steward pointed with a scowl. You'd better move it. Nora grabbed Gretchen by the elbow and steered her into the hallway leading further into the house. Hey, this is your deal. What do you need me for? I'm not going in there alone, Nora hissed. If someone has put a hex on this prince, I want an extra set of eyes on it. But I'm no good with hexes. Gretchen swerved to avoid a trunk being wheeled ahead of her. And I'm no good with anything on an empty stomach. Liable to say something stupid if anyone asks me something and you have your rep... Oh, hush. Nora's grip tightened. Don't you see how serious this is? The Baron will expect me to fix it. And undoing another witch's work is fraught. Gretchen sighed, pushing aside thoughts of a decent meal and a cup of tea. In truth, the Baron made her nervous, and after their last encounter, she would be happy to never see his face again. The lads by the double doors didn't stop the pair as they approached and opened them into a grand room filled with rich furnishings. The Baron and his wife sat with smiles that looked carved into their faces, across from a man in an embroidered purple robe and matching wide-brimmed hat. Gretchen's nose itched, but she resisted the urge to scratch. Your Lordship... Nora bobbed, dragging Gretchen down with a pinch. Gretchen kept her teeth clamped shut. She'd never seen this kind of formality with Nora before. Folding her hands in front of her, she ducked her head to avoid notice. Our resident witch. The Baron waved his hand toward the pair and nodded to his guest. Nora, would you care to tell Lord Frey if you recall preparing a hex for the Prince of Sharon? Never, your lordship. She bobbed again, and Gretchen caught it just in time to mimic her companion before being pinched again. I would expect nothing less, Lord Frey drawled. A vassal witch would never condemn her lord. I assure you, I mean no ill will to your nation. I'm sure you would agree we have both profited from our trade enterprises. I have no reason. Gossip travels over the waves, even to our island realm, Lord Frey interjected. Your sense of retribution is notorious, along with the sorceress you keep. He turned his glittering eyes toward Nora, and she swallowed. Perhaps if you would allow her to examine the prince. The baron held up his hand with a quirked eyebrow. Gretchen swept a cursory glance around the room at the mention of the prince. Aside from enough gilded furniture and jewelled ornamentation to keep her in coin for the rest of her days, she saw no sign of anything out of the ordinary. Lord Frey barked a laugh and sat back to cross his legs. You presume I'd let her within spitting distance of our dynasty? Let her finish what she started? I assure you, Lord Frey... Nora bobbed again. I mean absolutely no harm. If I could learn what kind of hex we're dealing with, perhaps I may be able to set things right. Lord Frey's eyes flickered to the coffee table between the two sofas, and Gretchen zeroed in on a silver box at its centre. From her vantage, she could see purple silk lining, and something green that... Gretchen recoiled as she reconciled the picture in front of her. The frog sitting in the box flicked out its tongue and she gasped in surprise. You dare show disrespect for our prince? Lord Frey glared at Gretchen. I, ah, uh, I mean your lordship, Gretchen bobbed. I mean no disrespect. Just wasn't expecting a froggy kind of problem here. He looks stellar for a frog, if you ask me. And I'm sure Nora... Gretchen clicked her teeth shut as the Baron made sweeping gestures across his neck. She dragged her sleeve across her nose... It felt like there was a fly up there ready to explode out her nose in a spray of snot. In Sharon, we don't keep witches. Lord Frey pursed his lips and turned back to the Baron. We consider them vile in proper society. We do have some precautionary relics to use if required. He fished a gold chain from his pocket and held it up. A dangling pendant glittered in its setting. A deep red ruby and Gretchen's eyes began watering. Your sorceress must submit to the chain of subservience if she wishes to approach the prince. He glanced at Nora with unconcealed suspicion. It will keep her from trying anything sinister. Gretchen's lip curled despite herself, and she took a step back as Nora shuffled forward, 
waiting for the Baron's ascent. He gave a terse nod, and Nora slung the chain around her neck with a shudder before leaning over the silver box to inspect the prince. This instrument, her voice wavered, keeps me from my power entirely. All I can see is a frog, same as you, to give a proper examination. I will not permit you to prod a member of the royal family with your tainted magic. Nora stepped back and took the chain off with a gasp. Lord Frey stood, looming over her, and she scuttled back looking to Gretchen, who had snuck almost entirely into a potted palm's fronds. Lord Frey turned to inspect the silver box and tucked the chain back into his pocket. Our business is concluded, then. I shall order an embargo drafted immediately. Wait, the Baron stood with both arms held up. If you won't permit Nora to examine the prince, at least give her some time to work it out. I'll wager she has just the thing in one of her spell books. All eyes swung to Nora, and she took a deep breath and gave a sharp nod. I can consult with my library. Three days. Lord Frey sat back on the sofa and plucked a grape from a bowl set beside the frog prince. Our ship will sail no later than that. After bobbing a handful more times and the Baron dismissing them, Gretchen and Nora hightailed it out of the drawing room and down the hallway. What on earth am I supposed to do with that then? Nora's voice was shrill. I have no idea. Gretchen scrubbed at her nose with a fist. All's I know is that Lord Frey is a wizard if ever I've seen one. A wizard? Nora's face screwed up. How can you be sure? Gretchen's breath caught and a sneeze erupted. I'm allergic to them. Chapter 2 Allergic? Nora scoffed. Since when? As far back as I can remember. Won't catch me anywhere near one. I've seen you with sorcerers before. I know relations are tight, but they are at the convention every year. Oh, I'm not talking about the garden variety conjurers. Gretchen wiped her eyes. I'm talking wizards with a capital W. The stronger they are, the bigger the reaction. And I'd say your man is top tier. How is that even a thing? Nora grumbled as she turned to a stone set of stairs leading down toward her workroom. Hold up, Gretchen stopped and held her hands to her hips. I'm still hungry and that kitchen is panic baking. There's no way I'm hanging around without a couple of choice morsels. Fine. Nora shook her head. Come see me when you're done stuffing your face. Gretchen's stomach gave an appreciative gurgle as she followed her nose to the kitchens. The commotion was still well underway as Gretchen snuck in and pulled up a stool at the far end of the table. And what do you think you're doing here? Cook stood with her back toward her, prodding cakes in the wood fire oven. Gretchen squirmed on her stool and scratched her head. Well, I haven't had a bite to eat all day, and with spread you've got going on here, all you'll get from me is a slice of bread and stew. She turned, her cheeks bright red from the oven's heat. A royal visit, without so much as a note sent ahead. And if the Baron is in a temper like Steward says, the only thing that will set things right is a raspberry tart. You know how hard it is to come by raspberries at this time of year? Preserves just won't do, and... Gretchen nodded and zoned out to find her meal. A large loaf lay forgotten on a side bench, so she cut herself a healthy slice and prodded a pot of congealed stew, left discarded by fancier offerings. What's so special about this Salem, then? she interjected. Sharon, an isle off the coast we do a good trade with. Cook handed her a bowl and returned to kneading dough. The Baron's father established close ties with them, years ago. In return for things like wool and silver, they ship delicacies that fetch a handsome price inland. Delicacies. Gretchen carried her bowl back to the table and bit into the crusty bread with a sigh. Small fish that flavour the stew you're eating and sea plants which come dried and powdered. Nothing magical so far as I know. She snorted a laugh and Gretchen shrugged. So the Baron is in big trouble if they decide to sell elsewhere. Never much of a money man, our Baron, Cook clucked. More inclined to spend it he is. Gretchen let Cook continue her work and shoveled food down. Even lukewarm, it was better than the fare she usually got, and she wiped the bowl clean with what remained of the bread. You can take a meal to Nora too, the cook sighed. Suppose this business will have her in a real tail flap. She's dreadful when she's in a temper, you know. I can spare a few apple pies. She always did have a sweet tooth. Gretchen brightened at the mention of pie, and was soon carrying a basket filled with goodies into the lower levels to Nora's workroom. She gave the door a gentle tap, and it wrenched open of its own accord. 
Nora stood with her back facing the door, hunched over a table which dominated the space. I come bearing sustenance. Gretchen licked her lips and stepped into the room. I guess this frog thing is a pretty big deal then. Big deal? Nora slammed shut the spell book she was scanning. This is a catastrophe. I could inspect the prince, H.M. What did they expect me to do with that bridle on? Have you ever seen one of those before? I didn't think something like that was possible. Who would create a magical item to stop magic? Gretchen dropped the basket on the table and laid out her companion's meal. Wizards, that's who. Nora's lip curled. Not a safe place for witches, Sharon. They're considered the lowest of the low. Doesn't surprise me that they keep items like that. But wizards are fine, Gretchen rolled her eyes. Typical. Even if I find a way to counter this hex, how am I supposed to make that happen? Nora pushed her spectacles up the bridge of her nose, her eyes fixed on the wall. I think you're right. Lord Frey must be a high-ranking wizard. I'll bet it grinds his gears that he can't set it right himself. And why is that? Gretchen slid a pie toward a stool further down and sat with her mouth watering. You never hear of wizards hexing people. I mean fire and brimstone, sure, but never a good old-fashioned curse. Surely they're capable, same as us. I suppose they think, if an explosion of some sort can't fix the problem, it's not worth doing. Nora's eye narrowed at the apple pie heading toward Gretchen's mouth. Getting your fill, are you? Gretchen waved at the array of food in front of Nora and took a bite of pie. Nora blinked at the food, like it had only just occurred to her, and dragged the lone padded seat over to slump into. She ate her meal in silence, and Gretchen struggled to find the right thing to say to the morose witch. So, um, what did the book say? Stumped. I have a few others, but I fear they'll be the same. She took a sip of watered wine and leaned back in her seat. Transforming a person into something else is a powerful hex, and needlessly complicated, I should say. It would have been much simpler for whoever came up with this to simply poison the poor wretch. Maybe they had a shred of conscience, Gretchen muttered. Three days, with no access to the subject, and without the means to make a test case. Nora chewed absently, not bothering to cover her mouth. Well, on the bright side, we scored ourselves a toadstone. Why don't we go cash it in and take the proceeds on vacation someplace until this blows over? Nora closed her eyes with the pained look Gretchen had become accustomed to when she knew she was getting under her companion's skin. This position, with the Baron, she took a deep breath. You all make fun at the salt and bog about how easy it is. It's true I get a lot of free time. She gave Gretchen a warning look, but it comes with a heavy burden. If there's a magical problem, I'm expected to solve it, no excuses. Gretchen pursed her lips, unsure what advice to give in a bind like this one and blinked when something perfectly sensible popped into her mind. Cordelia? Gretchen's eyes darted. She has access to the full suite of books in the Academy's library. Your sister? I didn't realise she was so prominent in the faculty. Well, she's been kissing butts there for years now. Makes a point of sending me a stupid card whenever she gets a promotion. Gretchen ran a tongue over her teeth. I doubt she'd let me use it, of course, but you may have more clout with her. Hmm? Nora's eyebrows furrowed, and she rubbed her jaw. I'd say that's worth a look. We can go tomorrow. I'll come past and we can fly together. Feeling dismissed, Gretchen stood and gave her belly a pat. Anything else you need? Consult your spell book, won't you? Gretchen chortled and shook her head. You must be desperate if you're prepared to put any stock in that jumble of pages. Nora's face remained grave. Never more in my life. Gretchen made hasty farewells and collected her broom on the way to the courtyard. Her friend's rattled state had infected her, and she tried to push away the gnawing feeling in her belly. Of course, Nora could fix this. She could fix anything. Vicious winds whipped her on the flight home, and when she tumbled into her vegetable patch, she sat for a minute, waiting for the dizziness to pass. On any other day, she may have stayed at Nora's until the weather subsided, but she would have been a distraction. Consulting one's spell book should be done in solitude, and although it wasn't openly discussed, there was a universal understanding among which kind. Giving her broom a pat as she stood, it had been on its best behaviour considering, she trudged to her front door and hung it over the threshold, where it gave a shudder of recognition and went slack. The yowling behind the door told Gretchen that Mulligan was less than impressed with a lack of breakfast either. 
Yes, yes, I'm home, Furball. Gretchen unlocked the door and Mulligan circled her legs. She scooped him into her arms and gave him a scratch behind the ears. You're only affectionate when your belly is empty. I've half a mind to keep you hungry. Mulligan gave her braid a tentative sniff and squirmed to get out of her arms. She let him go with a sigh. Well, what do you expect me to smell like after spending a morning hanging out in a swamp? After first settling the issue of Mulligan's breakfast and putting on the kettle, Gretchen turned to consider the rug on the floor of her living room. What she wanted was a hot bath and a nap, but a good friend would do everything she could to help figure out what was going on, even if it involved her temperamental spell book. While it had accomplished something incredible just a few short months earlier, she'd convinced herself that enchanting Jurgen, the troll who now tended bar at the Sultan Bog, was a fluke. Well, here goes nothing. She pried the book from underneath a loose floorboard and folded the rug over. I hope you're feeling helpful today. The book gave a cheerful thrum as she set it on her desk, and Gretchen hoped it was a good sign of things to come. She undid its laces, and the book popped open. Well, ah, uh, nice to see you too. Now we need to help get Nora out of a pickle. Got messed up in a hexing business that was none of her doing. A case of a prince being turned into a frog. You ever heard of something like that? The book hummed on the desk, and letters swam around on the page as it considered the question. Gretchen was wondering if it had gone into some kind of senile state when they formed a pattern of words before her eyes. Hmm, she squinted at the tight script. Yeah, I wasn't asking for your whole back catalogue of frog spells. A frog unhexing spell is what I need. The book gave a warning rumble, and Gretchen winced as the words reassembled. Much to her surprise, her response didn't elicit any kind of tantrum. There was a lone spell scrawled on the page, and as Gretchen read it, any hope she had of being of use faded. It was a frog transformation spell. He's already a frog, her voice was tight. We need to unfrog him. With that, the spellbook began spewing words off the page to dangle in her living room, and Gretchen's eyes widened at the banging and popping that sounded. Mulligan hissed somewhere from the kitchen, and the windows rattled in their casings. Gretchen held her hands up in supplication. OK, my bad. Let me write that spell down. It sucked the rogue enchantments back down, and Gretchen plucked a notebook and quill from a drawer. After she jotted down the spell, she laced the book's bindings again and stowed it back in its hidey hole. A frog transformation spell! Gretchen smacked her lips. Maybe if I make one, Nora can try to pick apart the enchantment. She considered her feline familiar with calculation, and he gave her a filthy look. Oh, come on, she crooned. You know it's unlikely to work in the first place. And you like Nora. Don't you want to help her out? Mulligan scarpered into the bedroom, and Gretchen heard him clambering up to his favourite hiding spot in the rafters. She muttered a curse about his lack of faith in her. Chapter 3 I don't understand why you're not as excited about this as I am. Gretchen ran a finger down the frog's back as they approached the academy. You turned a lizard into a frog. That's another thing entirely. Nora was in fine form, and the flight to the city had done nothing to cool her temper. But I turned a lizard into a frog. You have to admit that makes this whole frog hex thing less impressive than yesterday. Nora huffed as she trotted up the stone steps, and Gretchen curled her lip as she tucked the frog back in her pouch. She never enjoyed a trip to the academy, and only came as often as she needed to attend the compulsory conferences to keep her magic licence renewed. The whole building reeked of pretentious attempts to seem more important than it actually was, like acting the part would earn witches genuine respect. So, ah, uh, you need me to come in? Or should I see to our other business? Gretchen gave a sly wink. She's your sister, Nora rounded on her. And there'll be more books than I could possibly sort through in three, well, two days. Gretchen's shoulders sagged. OK, fine. But for the record, being her sister gives us less chance of getting into the library. She followed along in Nora's wake as she pushed open the heavy door and marched down the hallway. A young chit of a witch sat behind a desk by the stairs and gave them a solemn nod. Sisters, how can I help you today? Cordelia Mirkwood, Nora snapped. I need to see her right away. Do you have an appointment? The girl's eyebrow quirked a fraction. 
but she kept her face schooled to calm. If I had one, you'd know about it, Nora tapped a stack of paper on the desk. This is an emergency. You tell her Nora Brightstar is here to see her. The girl pressed her lips together and turned to a tangle of pipes set in the wall, bending to whisper into one of them. Nora kept her arms folded in front of her while they waited, and after a few moments the girl turned back to them. I'm afraid the Vice-Chancellor is rather busy. If you wouldn't mind waiting in the lounge, she may have some time. Not good enough. I'm a paying member of this academy, and if the Baron of Greenhaven hears about this slight... Gretchen put a hand on Nora's arm and narrowed her eyes at the girl. Inform the Vice-Chancellor that her sister's here and isn't above making a scene. The girl's eyes widened at that, and when she returned to the message wall, her whispers were more animated. With a few nods, she plastered on a smile as she turned. She'll be down directly. Nora gave Gretchen an appraising look as they moved away from the desk to loiter in the waiting area. What can I say? I'm an embarrassment. Gretchen smirked and sank onto a long bench along the wall. How many other sisters do you have in high places? The wry twist to Nora's mouth was the closest she'd been to smiling all day. It wasn't long before Cordelia swept down the staircase with a stern stare. Gretchen, what are you doing here? Cordelia, I'm sure you know Nora Brightstar. Gretchen waved toward her companion. Witch in residence to the Baron of Greenhaven. Of course. She straightened and turned with a polite smile. How can I help you exactly? A problem of diplomacy. One which would concern us all if things aren't resolved. Nora stood stiffly with her chin thrust in the air. Wondering at how much thought Nora had put into that statement, Gretchen followed them up the stairs after Cordelia had muttered something about her office. Her eyes wandered to the portraits of old women on the walls and the engraved plaques underneath them. In one of her notes, Cordelia had mentioned they had mounted one in honour of their great Aunt Esme, but Gretchen couldn't see it on their ascent to the upper levels. After closing the door behind them, Cordelia waved to a carved pair of chairs behind her desk. Now, if you could tell me what this is about. Gretchen zoned out as Nora recounted the tale of the prince's hex and the misplaced blame on the baron. Instead, she tinkered with a tiny replica bird, whose feathers changed colour as she stroked it. She was about to attempt an incantation to see if she could figure how the magic worked when her sister snapped at her. Well, hmm? Gretchen set the bird down. I wasn't listening. You said this man was a wizard. Cordelia's stare was intense. What else did you learn? Nothing, Gretchen shrugged. But I think we're looking at this the wrong way. We are, Nora turned to her in indignation. Yup, unpicking another witch's magic is about as pleasant as a sharp stick in the eye. We know you didn't put that hex on him, but who did? Both Cordelia and Nora leaned back, wearing the same shocked expression. I hate to burst your bubble and all, but I can use my noggin every once in a while. Gretchen sprawled back in her chair and puffed out her cheeks. So other than Nora, who would be capable of this kind of hex? Cordelia turned her nose up in a mulish stare and folded her hands in front of her. We at the Academy do not give out our members' confidential information. Think about it. Nora was back in control and adjusted her spectacles. If this doesn't get resolved, and we have royalty getting around with hexes on them, there'll be a price to pay. This isn't only about saving my bacon. It would be a black mark on every witch in this realm. The perfect excuse to clamp down on us and bring in draconian laws. Cordelia's eyes darted as she weighed Nora's argument, and she took a deep breath before crossing to the window to stare out over the city. This hasn't been our first issue with Sharon. They have diplomats here that make it their duty to meddle where they can. I doubt the hex came from our shores at all. All I can offer you is the use of the library to see if you can find something to deal with it. Thank you. Nora rose from her chair. This is time sensitive, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, so if we can get a move on. Cordelia unhooked a key from her belt and muttered something as she rolled it between her palms. You know the way? Of course I do. Nora snatched the key from Cordelia's hand. I'm not that old. Cordelia's lip twitched, and her eye flickered to Gretchen and back again. Keep an eye on her, would you? If I were you, I would have found a more suitable pair of helping hands. Nice to see you too, sister. Gretchen gave a mock salute as she stood and followed Nora back out to the winding hallways. Could have at least offered a couple of pupils to help us out. 
Gretchen snorted. Doesn't like to get her hands dirty, dear sis. If we figure this out, she'll be the first to stand behind us cheering. And if we fail, she'll deny having anything to do with it. They followed a confounding set of stairways down and then back up to reach the lowest subterranean levels of the academy. Gretchen had never understood the need for so many stairs in that place, and her feet dragged as they approached the grand doors. The accumulated wealth of knowledge of which kind, Nora gave a wistful sigh, always thought it a shame they keep it so inaccessible. It's also we gawk at these conferences while they give their boring talks. Nora slid the key in, and the intricate iron scrollwork on the door glowed as it swung open. Inside, the room opened into a brightly illuminated hall, with bookcases set in each of the looming walls. There had to be thousands of books, and two days seemed inadequate to pour through them. Don't look like that, Nora bustled in ahead of her. You're forgetting the index. Gretchen pocketed the library key and shut the door behind them with an echoing click. Absent were the rows of chairs she'd grown accustomed to, and in their place a scant few tables with plush chairs gave the upper echelons of witch society a place to study. Nora had already scuttled to the far wall where the only window streamed enchanted light onto a gilded lectern set up on an altar. The index. An enchanted catalogue of the buried knowledge lurking in the room. Nora was already staring down at the glowing page as Gretchen mounted the steps. To her, the page was blank, but from Nora's stare she knew she had already requested a list of books. Good. They keep them in some sense of order. It looks like most of the hexing titles are on that wall. Nora didn't look up as she pointed to her right. Great. Gretchen eyed the wall of books askance. Care to be any more specific? Three shelves from the corner and eight rows up. Gretchen left Nora to look over the more likely titles and frowned up at the books on the eighth row. There wasn't any sign of a ladder and she couldn't imagine someone like Cordelia climbing up the carved shelves. She was hiking up her skirts to do just that when Nora came up behind her and pushed her finger into the intricately carved timber which separated each case. A faint click accompanied the sound of gears working and Nora heaved the shelf downward. Gretchen stepped back to examine that piece of sorcery and watched as the rose collapsed into the floor and popped back up again at the ceiling. She had spent little time in the library, even when she was a pupil, and back then, touching the books was out of the question. Well, I'll be. Makes a certain kind of sense to want to keep this off limits, doesn't it? This kind of enchantment would be a pain in the rear end to put back together if it got tampered with. Nora ran a finger along the volumes on the wall and plucked out a purple volume with a titter. She handed it to Gretchen without a word and resumed her search. So, you want me to rifle through these? What questions were you planning on asking, anywho? I'm not sure if my book is just daft or if I don't make myself plain enough. I'll do the rifling. Nora stacked three books on top of the one Gretchen was holding. You can take the notes. Gretchen rolled her eyes and carried the stack to the closest table. It looked like she was in for an extended study session, and she had always hated taking notes. Chapter 4. It's Useless. Nora's head drooped to the table. Nothing but vague passages and absurd rituals. Gretchen stretched her arms overhead. Her joints gave a satisfying pop after sitting hunched for hours. Let's go get a drink, at least. Bags hung under Nora's despondent eyes, and she propped her forehead with her hand. In all their years of friendship, Gretchen had never seen her worried about anything. Nora was the calm, collected one, who had an answer for just about anything, or a sharp remark about what she didn't know. I suppose I should have one last hurrah before my life is ruined, Nora said. Hey, don't talk like that. I've written an entire volume of stuff. You're tired. What you need is a break and some fresh perspective. Stuff and nonsense. Look! Nora held up a sheet of scribblings. A hex which imparts a piece of oneself to make it work. Who in their right mind would do something like that? Well, in fairness, that book looked older than the rest. I wouldn't be surprised if it's lost its marbles. Gretchen lowered her voice. Now how about we see to our business transaction? Watch your mouth, Nora hissed, eyes darting wildly across the empty room. This place gives a new meaning to walls having ears. Well, let's have a meal someplace quieter. 
Nora raised her eyebrows in the absolute silence of the library, but made no protest as Gretchen stood and tucked their things in her pouch. They returned the spellbooks back to their shelves, and Gretchen locked the door behind them as they left. Should we return the key and update your sister on our progress? Nah. Gretchen looked up and down an intersecting hallway trying to remember the quickest route out. I'm sure she'd prefer to know as little as possible. She smacked her lips together and tried to recall the layout of the academy. Though quite familiar with the back exit from her youth, getting there was another issue. She opted to turn left and bustled down the hallway, leaving Nora to catch up. The portraits on the walls all looked the same. Stern. Old women hung there, she was sure, to scare the youngsters, and they helped to keep its layout mystifying. After a circuitous route, Gretchen pointed at a particularly ancient-looking likeness in disgust. We went past that one already. I despise this infernal place. Nora held a hand to her chest as she caught her breath. It's surprising they get anything done here at all. You could reach your twilight years just trying to find a bathroom. Explains the smell, Gretchen said, wrinkling her nose. Come on, let's go the other way. That time, Gretchen didn't miss the narrow passageway that seemed to slide away from her vision. A few short steps took them into a more utilitarian set of corridors, used for places like the kitchens and storerooms. At least this time I'm not sneaking out, Gretchen guffawed. I'd expect they'd throw me a farewell party for leaving this time round. That's not to say they wanted me to stay last time, but back then they were obligated. Nora snickered at that and soon they were at a small door by the refuse heaps, waiting for some wretch to take them out to the incinerators. Gretchen had found no end of amusing leavings among the stinking heaps when she'd been one of those wretches. So, are you going to tell me about this super-secret contact now? Nora had been cagey ever since she began the quest to get her hands on a toadstone. Gretchen was only grateful for the offer to get a cut in return for hanging out in the filthy muck with her. She opened the door and blinked as she stepped into the night, though it didn't surprise her that so much time had passed. Christoph, Nora whispered, as she trotted out of the laneway and onto the city streets, procuring one for his lord who is plagued with fears of poison in his soup. What's so top secret about that? It was Gretchen's turn to follow Nora down the cobbled streets, slicked with the night's moisture. Well, he's paranoid, isn't he? Won't buy one from the regular alchemist merchants for fear his enemies will off him another way. Gretchen scoffed. That's the most ridiculous thing I've heard all week. Well, maybe except for turning people into frogs. I mean, what is with rich folks? Shouldn't they be too busy making money to be coming up with stupid ways to hurt each other? Oh, Gretchen, Nora sighed. You're painfully naive sometimes. Doing away with their rivals is the most lucrative exercise of all. Gretchen rolled her eyes at that and focused on where Nora was leading them. She expected to be heading toward the castle where the nobility built their houses as closely as they dared, but Nora turned into a street she tried to avoid whenever she could. Christoph is a wizard. Gretchen's lip curled at the shops with magical offerings all lined up in one place. Only a hop, skip and a jump away from the wizard academy, which was naturally a ritzier part of the city. In the Lord's employ... Nora kept close to the shadows as she scurried along. Gretchen almost smacked into her when she turned into a narrow gap between two buildings around the back of what looked like a shop dealing in magical novelties, and her nose twitched. Nora scratched on the back door in a particular sequence, and it opened almost immediately to show a wizened man staring down at her. Christoph, Nora cleared her throat. I was told to ask after him here. The man's moustaches ruffled as he pursed his lips, and Gretchen sneezed. Go to the swine and claw. I shall pass on the message. The door slammed, and Gretchen dragged her sleeve over her nose. Wizards, Nora muttered. Nothing's ever straightforward with their sort. Gretchen followed her back onto the street, sniffling and fell into stride beside her companion. The swine and claw? I thought he didn't want to attract attention. Nora shrugged, and together they tracked together to a seedier part of the city, where the more noxious side of the industry took place. Gretchen was familiar with the swine and claw, but even she was careful to mind her P's and Q's when she walked into that establishment. A pair of ogres stood guard at the doors, and they offered no resistance as the witches approached. From what Gretchen could discern, their purpose was to keep regular folks out, 
though she couldn't see why it would be much of a problem. Evening, Nora. The one on the right gave her friend a nod, and Gretchen's eyes bugged out in surprise. Gretchen pitched her voice low as they passed between the pair. You're on a first-name basis with the door guys here. I do some dealings here from time to time. Nora's voice was prim, and she stood a little straighter. Some of the Baron's business requires a... particular approach. Including thugs and miscreants, Gretchen muttered. Inside, things were looking rowdy with a bunch of ghosts hovering over a table shouting bawdy ballads at the tops of their voices. Elves and dwarves cheered them on, happily drinking alongside each other, while leprechauns added their tune on pipes and fiddles. Sturdy brownies wearing bright smiles milled around the crowd, one of them sweeping dung from behind a group of centaurs who looked deep into their cups. Come on, it's quieter upstairs. Nora led the way onto the mezzanine floor, where small tables sat in a space which looked intentionally darkened. Patrons sat positioned so as to not attract notice, and Gretchen blinked a couple of times to adjust to the gloom. Nora, a woman purred from behind a small bar, welcome back. It was the small horns protruding from her forehead that Gretchen noticed first, and her eyes travelled down to her cloven hooves as she clip-clopped over to show them to a table. Too dumbfounded to make a smart Alec remark, she dropped onto a ladder-back chair and clicked her teeth shut as Nora ordered ale and meals. Are you a VIP or something? I've never even seen a fawn before. Aren't they all supposed to be beyond the seas? Panna was imported. Oh, don't give me that look. On that continent, they aren't seen as people. Most of them are in slavery. With Nora looking increasingly snippy, Gretchen turned to watch the ghosts regale the audience with their squalling. When a chair scraped out from the table behind her, she jumped near out of skin as she turned to see a young, bearded man settle down with a nod to Nora. I trust you have what I'm seeking, he asked. Gretchen did a double take down to the ground floor and back up to the table. She would have seen him if he'd come up those stairs, which meant there must be another way up to the mezzanine. A toadstone, as requested. Nora set the murky brown stone on the table with a click. Christoph reached to grasp it, and Nora pinned his hand with hers and tittered. A matter of the price first. I told you what I was willing to pay, Nora. I won't have you trying to fleece me at the last minute. Gretchen saw a dangerous glimmer in his eye, even through her own watering ones. Perhaps gold isn't what I want. Nora flashed an unpleasant smile. It isn't. Gretchen's mind reeled and she sniffled. Because I like gold just fine. I suppose silver will do, but there's every chance it might roll around in my pouch and get lost forever. Nora gave her a withering stare, and Gretchen stopped mid-sentence to sneeze. I have a dilemma of the magical sort, one that I could use a wizard's perspective on. Gretchen narrowed her eyes at her friend and held her nose against the itch. While it wasn't surprising that Nora would spring something like that on her, the implication that she wouldn't willingly give over her share to help stung. A magical problem a witch can't solve. Christoph leaned back with a smug smirk. It's not often you hear that kind of admission. Nora shifted on her seat with a scowl but said nothing. Well, I'm not about to agree until I hear what it is. He twirled his finger in the air. I've made enough deals with your sort to know about setting the terms first. Nora ran a tongue over her teeth, taking her time to come up with the right words. Panna brought their ale with a smile and a promise to be right back with their plates while Nora narrowed her eyes at the wizard. I'll expect absolute discretion, or I'll make it known that you've been wagging your tongue about your master. Christoph bristled at the word master, took a deep breath, and gave a sharp nod. Nora took a sip of ale and smacked her lips. My name is being dragged through the mud by the Prince of Sharon, a hexing matter I had no part in. If we don't fix it, there will be hostilities that won't bode well for my position. Christoph barked a laugh as Panna set their meals in front of them, and he reached to help himself to a generous slice of cheese. Gretchen blew her nose on the napkin tucked under her plate, and made a silent plea for the wizard to hurry up and get lost. The Prince of Sharon, eh? And what seems to be the problem? Itchy trousers? Unable to slake his lust? Turned into a frog. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her face. Christoph coughed and beat at his chest. A frog? Yup, his highness, the frog, has his very own royal silver box to croak around in. That's a powerful piece of sorcery if ever I've heard one. 
I'm not sure a witch could pull something like that off. Gretchen sneezed and leaned her head back to stare at the ceiling. Certainly not one that can't cure herself of a bad case of the sniffles. It's not the sniffles, Gretchen took a careful breath. I'm just allergic to bull dust. Could you make some inquiries? Time is of the essence, as I'm sure you'll understand. Nora couldn't quite keep the pleading note out of her voice. I don't have time to go flitting around a wild goose chase. His lordship is more unreasonable than ever. Besides, hexes aren't openly discussed among our ranks. Nora drooped in her seat, and Gretchen held the bridge of her nose and took charge. How about we take the gold? I'm guessing from his lordship's purse, and if you find anything that could be of use, we can trade the gold back and you can line your own pocket. H.M.? Christoph dropped the sack of gold on the table with a metallic thump and scooped up the stone. I'll do a bit of digging, but don't get your hopes up. Nora's composure cracked as he strode off, that time down the regular stairs, and she buried her face in her arms on the table. The clip-clopping of Panna's hooves approached from behind, and she leaned over the table to put a hand on Nora's back. Did I hear you say Sharon? Terrible place, that forsaken rock, filled with hypocrites and murderous intrigue. Gretchen gave her eyes a final wipe and took a clear breath before patting the chair next to her. Sit down and tell us what you know. Chapter 5 So they cast witches out and consider wizards fortuitous. I don't see how that differs from here. No, no, Panna tittered. I'm not making myself clear. No witch may own property in Sharon. When one is born in a high caste family, she is turned out onto the street. Gretchen blinked and took another sip of ale. Can't say I've ever heard of the nobility around here having magical types in them either. They make matches very carefully there, Panna's voice slowed, as if she were talking to a child. They want magical traits in their offspring, so long as they aren't female. The information bounced around Gretchen's brain and settled into some sense of order. Nora gave a groan from the other side of the table, and Gretchen absently refilled her cup from the jug between them. So the aristocracy is full of wizards, or men who want to be wizards, all backstabbing each other to seize power? Sounds like a real viper's pit. Panna nodded vigorously. Intrigue is second nature to them, along with assassinations. I'm not surprised it was the prince who was targeted. They say he has a wicked temper and less tolerance for witches in their city than most. Interesting. Gretchen swirled her own cup and drank down the rest. Keep them coming for her, would you? I've got to see a book about a spell. Gretchen slipped out of the swine and claw and hurried back toward the witch's academy. She knew she was allergic to wizards for a reason. Bunch of scoundrels, the lot of them. That Lord Frey was being uncooperative for a reason, and Gretchen needed to find something that could prove it. The route to the library was more straightforward the second time around. Gretchen thought the befuddling design had much to do with a person's sense of urgency. And when she snapped a list of requirements at the index, a list of five books appeared on the blank page. After locating them on the wall, she pulled them out and reached into her pouch for her little friend. The lizard now frog sat on the desk, long into the night watching her work, and she marvelled that it seemed so unfazed by its alien surroundings. After scribbling a handful of spells she thought might be useful, she took off to collect her companion. On her way out... She stopped short when she saw a familiar face. Great Aunt Esme. She was positive they'd not been in this particular hallway last time. It was a favourable likeness. Turning the library key over in her palm, inspiration struck, and she carefully sat it underneath the frame against the wall for safekeeping. Cordelia could send her a letter if she wanted to know where to find it. Or better yet, she could come and visit her childhood home. When she opened the back door... She truly was surprised to hear the chatter of birdsong and the first rays of sun bathing the slumbering city. Stifling a yawn, she hurried off to the tavern. If her plan was going to work, they'd need to get moving. The ogres from the front doors of the Swine and Claw were long gone by the time Gretchen arrived and she circled around the building cursing. Christoph had gotten in another way, but for the life of her she couldn't spot it. When she clambered above the first floor windows, a voice startled her and she fell to the cobbles in a heap. I was wondering when you'd come fetch her. Panna had her arms crossed with a smirk. 
Gretchen frowned at the brick wall which had swung out at Panna's touch. She hadn't sensed a scrap of magic as she circled the building and wondered what shady doings were conducted in and out that door. Is she awake? Gretchen dusted herself off. She's been snoring for hours, she snorted. Not the first time I've had to move her on in the early hours. Well, at least someone got some shut eye, Gretchen grumbled. She followed Panna up a narrow set of stairs next to what looked like a cellar at the back of the building. The other patrons had long gone, and Nora's snores reverberated through the timber floors. Gretchen brought down her booted heel with a loud thump, and Nora jerked awake, flying up in her seat with hair plastered across her face. Feeling better? Gretchen quirked an eyebrow. Ugh! Nora swallowed with a wince. You can take me out the back and be rid of me. It would be a kindness. Not that easy, I'm afraid. She sat beside Nora and slapped her folded notes on the table. Unless that's a spell to turn a frog into a prince, I'm not interested. It's a spell to convince people we can do exactly that. She turned to Panna. Any chance of a coffee? Maybe some breakfast? The horned waitress rolled her eyes but turned back toward the kitchens. In their discussion the night before, Gretchen got the feeling the girl had a soft spot for Nora. And how does that help? When it doesn't work, we'll be back where we started, and in hotter water. This Lord Frey fella seems to me it's awfully strange he wouldn't allow you to examine the prince. Gretchen tapped the table for emphasis. He's a wizard. We've established that. He would know how fruitless it was to have you look at the frog wearing that what's it. If you ask me, I'd say he was complicit in this whole sordid affair, maybe even responsible. Nora blinked a few times and rubbed her eyes. I still don't see how this helps our cause. We go to Sharon, make up some story about the spell only working there. Then we find who did it and make our case. Gretchen's face lit up at her own logic, and she held her arms up with a grin. That's the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard. Nora grimaced and pushed her chair back. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll be looking into likely places to become a hermit. Think about it. Gretchen snapped her fingers. Panna here says these people conspire against one another like a favourite pastime. Cordelia was right when she said the hex wasn't from these shores. I'd agree, Nora nodded. But proving that someone else did it in a foreign land where witches are considered parasites is insane. You're Nora Brightstar, Gretchen stamped her foot. You got accused of this for a reason. People tremble when they hear that name. Watch over their shoulder to make sure their fortunes don't take a nosedive. It's time you stood up to your reputation and march onto that island to prove you didn't do it. Besides, I've been scouring the library all night and found a spell that'll help to identify the culprit. Nora's lip twitched and her eyes darted. After balling her fists at her side, she gave a tight nod and sat back at the table with a look of calculation. Some kind of divination spell to locate the hex's cure. That may just work. If I manage that, I'm sure my reputation will only get worse. Or better, Gretchen shrugged depending on how you look at it. They shared a hasty breakfast as Panna swept the floors with a warning she would lock up at any minute. Nora looked over the scrawled pages between mouthfuls, and by the time they got back onto the streets, people were already about their business, preparing for a new day. Gretchen steered them toward the stable she used as a take-off space, and fished their brooms out of her infinity pouch, much to the awe of the stable lads who were already wielding shovels and hay forks. Well, I guess it's time to get our game faces on. Nora took the first turn at launching into the air. Looking forward to it, Gretchen muttered as she scowled at her broom. She was exhausted and in no mood to play games with her wayward broomstick. Deciding that fast was best, she launched across the bare patch of dirt and just scraped by the low wall, hemming the horses in. With Nora ahead, she gave her broomstick the rein it needed to catch up and rode out the waves of turbulence which threatened to topple her from her perch. Lamenting the fact sleeping was near impossible while miles up in the air, she tried to find a comfortable position and settled in for the ride. At least Nora was keeping the pace up, so long as she didn't try any party tricks. As always, it seemed like the way home was double the time, despite good weather and clear skies. By the time she tumbled from her broom in the Baron's garden, she thought she may have been able to challenge the no-sleeping-on-broomsticks rule. Nora was quick to spring off toward the estate house, though, and Gretchen stumbled to catch up to her. You don't want to maybe get a cup of tea first? 
Maybe a nice lie down for an hour or two? If I don't do this now, I'll lose my nerve. Nora climbed the back steps into the servants' quarters and marched down the hall. Where's Steward? she called. Cook's plump face appeared around the corner and her eyebrows climbed her forehead. He's seeing to the Baron. They're out by the stables. Nora turned on her heel and passed Gretchen by in the hall. With legs that felt like lead, she followed and felt around in her pouch to reassure herself the frog lizard was safe. The stable stood in a block away from the main house, and the Baron was known to have a fondness for horses which outstripped his fondness for his wife. An avid breeder of hunting mounts, it was no surprise he was showing off his prize animals to his unwanted houseguest. As Nora strode into the open archway, Gretchen caught a flash of purple robes, and her nose twitched. She reminded herself to put some thought into a wizard hay fever tincture if they made it out of this unscathed. Nora, the Baron's deep voice sounded strained. We've been eagerly awaiting your return. I come bearing answers, her voice was haughty, and Gretchen fought a smirk, and a demonstration to satisfy Lord Frey's quibbles. The Lord in question curled his lip, but gave a tight nod as the Baron waved him toward the house. Gretchen trailed behind the group, hesitant to catch a whiff, and they entered through the front door close to the Baron's study. Two guards in foreign regalia stood in the hall, each as stiff as a statue. Gretchen's last memory of the oak-lined walls and heavy desk were when she'd delivered a confession that had earned a few days in the dungeon for her trouble. She tracked in lightly on the plush carpets and stood by a bookshelf, hoping to melt into the wall. So, if you would allow me to explain, Nora inclined her head, the only means we have to undo this curse is to conduct the ritual in the place it was cast. Lord Frey's brows furrowed, and he glanced at a shelf on the opposite wall where a mouldering fruit tray sat beside a silver box. Gretchen wondered absently if the flies had to be vetted before being fed to his frogginess. You said something about a demonstration? He sat in a leather-upholstered wing-back chair and folded his hands in his lap. Of course. Gretchen? Nora held out a hand. Gretchen undid the laces of her pouch and rummaged around for the frog. She noted a flicker across Lord Frey's face as her arms went in almost to her shoulder, but he said nothing about her infinity pouch. This won't be messy, will it? The Baron almost looked resigned to the fact, given what he knew about Gretchen's antics. Not at all. Well, at least it shouldn't. With Nora doing the casting, I'm sure it will be just fine. Gretchen handed the frog over and scuttled back to outside the sniffing zone. Behold, a frog who is in fact a lizard... A test subject, if you will. Cursed right in this very house, I will undo the enchantment and restore it to its true form. Nora drew a small vial out of her sleeve with a flourish and set the frog on the floor. Before it could hop away, she sprinkled the potion over its shiny green skin and closed her eyes to mutter an incantation. Its form bulged and contorted before snapping back into a lizard with a pop. Before Nora could get a handle on its now skinnier body, it raced off under the desk and the Baron lifted his feet with an undignified squeak. You proved yourself capable of turning a lizard into a frog. Lord Frey's voice was smooth and he tapped his fingers together. If you were so confident in your abilities, why did you not try this method with a person? Nora smacked her lips together and her eyes darted. It is complicated to explain for those without magical insight. I could perform the same tests on Gretchen here, but it would only show you my capacity to undo my own spells. Where the trick lies is undoing another witch's spell, and Gretchen was responsible for this curse in particular. His eyes glittered at the implication, but he made no mention of his own abilities. An indulgence, then. If you are proposing to perform magic on our prince, you can first reassure us of your skill. It won't be a problem now, will it? Well, if that would put your mind at ease... Nora flashed a smile and turned to Gretchen, who stood frozen, her mind reeling. You wouldn't mind being a good sport, hmm? Chapter 6 I can't believe I'm letting you do this, Gretchen's feet dragged as they returned to the Baron's study. May as well throw me into the marsh out there and let me get eaten by the giant toad. Don't be like that! Nora huffed. It's a simple transformation spell of my own doing. Another thing entirely. 
Both the Baron and Lord Frey were right where they'd left them a few hours before with a game board of chess between them. From the pained look on the Baron's face, Gretchen guessed that he wasn't winning. Ah, you're back, the Baron clapped his hands. I trust everything is in readiness. Nora inclined her head and reached over to thrust Gretchen forward. I have prepared a spell and will perform it in its entirety to satisfy any doubts Lord Frey has. Gretchen wondered at what had happened to the habitual bobbing and decided against it anyhow. If she tried, she was convinced her knees would buckle. She pulled her pointed hat from her head and held it across her chest as she felt the potion dousing over her braid. Squeezing her eyes shut and banishing the sound of Nora's mutterings, random thoughts scattered around her brain. What would Mulligan do without her? Did she put the washing out on the line this time? Whatever happened to that guy who said he'd be back for the itching potion? When she opened her eyes, her vision was alien, and a looming purple shadow in front of her stooped to pick her up. She blinked a couple more times to try to focus on the man's face, and squirmed when his long fingers prodded her belly. Although she was pretty sure a frog couldn't sneeze, her nose still itched like crazy, and when his face drew close to hers, she felt mucus pushing out through her pores. He dropped her to the floor with an unintelligible exclamation, and she was plucked up by the leg again in short order. Her froggy face dangled in front of Nora's as the witch uncorked another vial with her teeth and bathed her in the acrid brew. Her amphibian body's convulsions kept her from thinking about anything at all. She felt stretched, folded over and squished all at once and seconds dragged on before it all went white. When she cracked her eyes open, the first thing that occurred to her was her clothes, or lack of them. The room's inhabitants each seemed unsure which way to look, and Gretchen scrambled to pull her dress over her torso. You happy now? You got frog slime along with an unclothed witch for your trouble. If I didn't know better, I'd say you were expecting it, hoping even. If I... A sneeze exploded from Gretchen's nose with her own mucus flying across the air. Perhaps we should go back to the stables, the Baron ventured with his lip curled. You got what you asked for in any case. Lord Frey reached over to poke Gretchen in the ribs and sniffed the air, as if testing for an illusion. This does not convince me to allow this magical procedure. Well, let's ask your monarch about that, shall we? Nora's eyes blazed with defiance, and Gretchen grabbed what remaining underclothes were on the floor and dived behind the Baron's desk. The words hung in the air of the Baron's study, and there was a lengthy pause before Lord Frey responded. We can set sail by tonight, the king can see what he makes of all this. The sound of footfalls signalled their departure, so Gretchen dressed hastily and gave a shudder as she turned to Nora. I'm never letting you turn me into a frog again, you hear? I don't care how much hot water you're in, Nora Brightstar. It worked. Nora sagged, then checked herself as the guards came in to stand in front of the silver box. Their faces were impassive, but Gretchen got the feeling they'd cut her down as soon as look at her if she tried to get between them and that box. With a nod toward the door, Nora hurried out and led Gretchen down to her workroom. If we're leaving tonight, we won't have much time to get this divination spell done. And how do you propose getting a single drop on that frog? Ask to see it again. Keep the vial up your sleeve or something. Gretchen wiped at imagined muck on her face and worked her tongue in her mouth. She couldn't shake the urge to keep sticking it out of her mouth. And while you're about that, I'll see to some kind of hay fever brew. If I have to spend time on a ship with that snot-inducing conjurer, you'd better believe I'm doing it well prepared. Nora halted in front of the door and turned to her with a strange look. Why are you doing this, Gretchen? None of this is yours to bear. Well, Gretchen scratched her head, this is what friendship is about, isn't it? One witch standing by another? Helps I have no sense of self-preservation and this mess is more interesting than selling medicinals in the city. Nora enfolded her in a hug and Gretchen's eyes bugged out. She patted her friend awkwardly on the back. I can't think of a single witch who would stick their neck out like this. Thank you, you really are a treasure sometimes. If sticking my neck out comes with anything sharp, I'm likely to bail on you, Gretchen coughed. Just saying is all. I think we have a pretty good chance, maybe 50-50. And I could use a little infamy myself if we managed to pull it off. Nora rolled her eyes and unlocked the door to her workroom. With more rummaging, Gretchen produced the notes needed to concoct a spell to divine the source of the hex and fetched ingredients from Nora's well-stocked storeroom. By the time they assembled everything, 
A cauldron hung over a crackling fire, and Nora pushed her spectacles up her nose as she weighed each addition on her scales. Mind if I... <sighs> Gretchen waved to the storeroom, and Nora gave a disinterested nod. Although her own supplies had steadily grown since setting up shop in the city, Gretchen was still envious over Nora's hoard of exotic powders and oils, all brought with the Baron's coin. It didn't stop her helping with a potion or two if Nora got stuck with something a little more complicated than the common cold. But Gretchen's ability to improve her craft was hampered by not having steady supplies. If you're looking for something to dry up your nose, try the jellied centaur hoof. Gretchen blinked. She'd never even realised that was a thing, and scoured the shelves looking for the marked jar. Sealed with wax, it looked an ominous shade of blue, but when she cracked it open with her pocket knife and took a whiff, she was pleasantly surprised when her nose cleared almost instantly. Now where did you get your hands on something like that? Gretchen yawned and settled on a stool by the fire, back pressed against the stone walls. Nora might have said something, but sleep was already tugging at her tired eyes. I still say it's a bad idea. Get it wrong and the Baron will have a war on his hands. Gretchen cracked an eye open and wondered at how much time had gone by. Cook was busy emptying a basket filled with something that smelled both hearty and sweet onto the table, with her lips pressed together in a firm pout. And if I don't, his treasury will dry up before the year is out. No, this has to be done, and I have a plan to uncover who was responsible for this. Nora noticed Gretchen rubbing her eyes. Oh, still with us then? Thought we might have to haul your skinny backside to the ship unconscious. Gretchen stretched her arms overhead and her stomach rumbled at the spread on the table. Just getting a little shut-eye. Unlike some, I didn't get a wink last night. Nora snickered as she sat at the table and Cook bustled off with her basket, a worried frown still etched on her face. I didn't realise you got home delivery around here. I don't, Nora harumphed. Seems nobody among the Baron's servants think I have it in me to pull this off. Don't mind them. Gretchen poured herself a cup of wine and took a healthy swig. This will be as easy as pie once we get there. Did she bring any? Pies, I mean. Nora pushed a bowl of stew in front of her, and Gretchen took to it eagerly with a shrug. Nora wolfed hers down in minutes, and was up and about checking on her things as Gretchen wiped her bowl clean with a slice of bread. Come on, there'll be no waiting for us, and Lord Frey ordered his people to be ready following the afternoon meal. It's only afternoon? Gretchen blinked up at the narrow window set near the ceiling. This has to be one of the longest days I've endured. Stop your grouching and get to your feet. Nora slung a pack over her shoulder and headed to the door. The weather outside had deteriorated to a steady drizzle and Lord Frey's party assembled unflinching out in the courtyard. Although they didn't seem familiar with the mounts or carriages they'd hired in the docks, there was a sense of order among them that wasn't usually found among the hired help. So, are we riding or flying? Gretchen rolled her shoulder with a crack. Well, I don't know about you, but I won't be chancing those clouds. Besides, Stuart insisted on accompanying us out to the docks. Almost as if on cue, a carriage turned out from the Baron's stables with a more modest box than the usual pomp. Stuart stuck his head out of one window and scanned the area before his eyes settled on the pair with a scowl. Jerking his thumb, his head disappeared and they hurried to get in out of the rain. I will accompany you for the entire journey, he snapped as they settled onto the padded benches. The Baron thought it would be prudent to have someone along to make sure you didn't make any faux pas. A what? Gretchen screwed her face up and Nora patted her hand. He only means to say they think we will say something stupid and get ourselves into a bigger mess. Well, I can't argue with that one. Gretchen scrubbed a hand over her eyes. How far away is this Sharon? Quite close. We should be there by morning if the seas are favourable. Steward fetched a ledger and opened it on his lap. And I mean to be back before the week is out. Far too many things to be done to waste time on this kind of escapade. Gretchen ignored the sharp remark, and it wasn't long before the train set out with their carriage trailing along behind. The ride to the docks itself wasn't that far, and Gretchen stepped onto the lurching ship with a sigh. She was never a fan of ships, and certainly not one spending the whole journey sneezing. She unstopped her jellied hoof as Lord Frey walked past and held it to her nose with a scowl. Getting a ship underway with its passengers settled in was a tedious process, 
and they waited for a favourable tide to carry them out to sea. Leaving Stuart to his own devices in their cramped cabin, Gretchen stared across the glittering water as she leaned on the rails. There'd been no chance to bump into the silver box as they loaded the prince, and Gretchen wondered when they'd have another chance to intervene and apply the potion. I always thought I might like to spend my days sailing, you know. Nora joined her at the stern. Why? Gretchen curled her lip. Sailors don't wash themselves nearly as often as they should, considering they float on water. I can smell the crew from here. Remind me to do a little research on that sensitive nose of yours when we return home, Nora smirked. It may hold more hidden talents we could put to good use. Sneezing on wizards and being painfully aware of the great unwashed is no gift. What has you in such a crabby mood? Her friend frowned. Well, we've gotten this far, granted. But I've been thinking about these Sharon people. Gretchen took a deep breath. We might get proof of who cast that spell, but getting them to believe it won't be easy. I know, Nora patted Gretchen on the back. I'm putting my faith in that harebrained skull of yours to come up with a cunning plan. Her friend's words didn't fill Gretchen with confidence. Chapter 7 What do you mean, the spell must be lifted here? The king's moustaches puffed out in outrage. It makes no sense! This hag was responsible for my son's predicament, and she wasn't here when it happened. The witch maintains her innocence in the matter, sire, Lord Frey drawled, but offered to put it right to heal the rift between our nations. Might I add? Steward held up a hand. Silence! the king bellowed. You would have further witchcraft besmirch my son? We should have her burned. No hex can outlive its maker. Nora blanched and reached to grasp Gretchen's hand. The witch demonstrated her ability to turn that one, he waved at Gretchen, into a frog and then back again. Perhaps if she could replicate this for your inspection. It would make things easier, Nora's voice quavered, if you'd allow me to examine the prince thoroughly to establish the root of this hex. The throne room fell silent, and the nobility crowded around and shuffled in the awkward interlude. He's already a frog, Gretchen cleared her throat. What worse could she do? If she tried anything, I'm sure you'd have those guys with pointy things on her faster than you could say ribbit. Steward glared at Gretchen, and she clicked her teeth shut. While the king still wore a look of disgust on his face, he seemed to weigh the argument in his mind. You then, he pointed at her. Put the chain of subservience on her and allow her to approach my son. I don't think you get the picture here, Gretchen said while squeezing Nora's hand. With that stupid muzzle on, all I'll see is his shiny green backside, same as you. Gretchen slipped the vial up her sleeve as the crowd recoiled, and if the king's face got any more mottled, she fancied he'd do himself an injury. Put it on her, now. She will wear it until we can throw her off our island. Insolent creatures. When other kingdoms come to their senses, witches will all be contained and put to more modest work. Lord Frey glided over and slipped the chain neatly over Gretchen's head. It was suffocating, like someone clamping down on her windpipe. He grabbed her elbow with cutting fingers and hauled her toward the throne where the prince sat propped on a pillow beside his father. Shoved to her knees, she came eye to eye with the frog and his tongue flickered out in interest. Blinking her watery eyes, she unstopped the vial and the sneeze that followed offered the opportunity to raise her hand and splash the contents over him. Harsh hands hauled her back and guards loomed with pointed spears as they pinned her to the ground. What was that? The king stood at her feet and glared down at her. I'm allergic, you see, to wizards. A gasp almost in concert sounded throughout the crowd. Panna had explained the taboos of talking about magic in polite society. Take her away, the king waved. And her companion too. I'll have the embargo delivered this very day. As if she were a bag of beans, the guards hauled her up and carried her toward the exit. Gretchen caught sight of Nora nodding to the crowd, and a young girl with smoky eyes and long dark hair was glowing a faint shade of purple. Gretchen's mouth hung open with surprise, despite itching eyes and snot hanging over her lips. It was quickly replaced with a grin as she put the pieces together. Not escaping the guards' wrath, they collected Nora and escorted them to simple rooms she assumed were near the servants' quarters and thrust them inside together. Gretchen grimaced when she saw the guards' feet remain fixed underneath the door. In a foreign country, 
under guard, having insulted their king. Nora held a hand to her forehead and took deep breaths. But did you see her? And they think they have a handle on witches. That one was right under their noses. Gretchen took out a hanky and cleaned her face. Who do you suppose she is? Nora tapped a finger against her mouth. A scorned lover, perhaps? Maybe he learned her secret? We need steward and pronto. Gretchen unhooked her pouch and undid its laces on the floor. I might have something in here that can sneak us out. Don't bother, Nora waved her hand. He'll be tied up in negotiations. When it's over, he'll come past to deliver our fate. Gretchen frowned up at Nora and sighed. Well, I told you I wouldn't hang around if it meant my skin. You can stay here and be melodramatic all you like, but I'm getting out of here and finding that girl. After rummaging through her infinity pouch and pouring through some of the more unsavoury items she kept tucked away, she pulled her arm out with a scowl. Her mind was racing at a million miles per hour, and she couldn't think of a single thing that would get her out of a locked room with armed guards. She promised herself for the umpteenth time that she would get around to brewing more just-in-case potions when she got home and sat back against the stone walls. Mice! Nora stood staring at the single window fitted with iron lacing. Mice? Gretchen cast around, looking for signs of vermin. She detested mice almost as much as Mulligan liked chasing them. We have what we need on hand for a transformation spell. Nobody would notice a mouse creeping around the palace. Gretchen's eyebrows climbed her forehead, and she pushed herself to her feet. Nah, uh, no, you don't. I said very clearly that I was never doing that again. You said that about frogs. Mice are an entirely different subject. Nora turned with a look of calculation. Of course, only one of us can go, and I must speak with Steward when he finally arrives. Gretchen set her jaw and willed her mind to come up with a better idea. But she had nothing. Now, how do you think I'll find her again on those itty-bitty legs? And what happens when it wears off and I don't have any clothes? You'll think of something, Nora pressed her lips together. The girl was quite close to the throne. It wouldn't surprise me if she's a member of the royal family. Just keep climbing until you get to the fanciest part of the palace. I don't know how well the divination spell will hold as she moves further away from the prince, but if she remains in the palace, she shouldn't be hard to spot. Gretchen closed her eyes and sagged against the wall, imagining her life coming to a bitter end in the jaws of a feline. It was irony on an epic scale. All you have to do is confront her and convince her to put it right. Otherwise this king may very well put us on the stake. Gretchen's eyes whipped open at that, an involuntary quiver running along her spine. Eaten by a cat or be put to the flame. One death ludicrous, and the other the deepest fear of any witch in the realm. Having a funny story in her eulogy seemed more fitting somehow. All right, she bent to fetch the right vial from her pouch, but I'm not sure how much I'll accomplish if I can't take a single potion with me. Nora plucked the vial from her hand. Probably do more harm than good, she muttered, unable to argue with her logic. Gretchen sat her pointed hat on the single narrow bed in the room and kicked off her boots for fear of getting stuck in one when the spell was cast. After folding her skirts and putting them beside her hat, she stood hugging herself with a shiver. Nora could take care of her undergarments. She wouldn't suffer the indignity of being turned into a mouse while buck naked. Of course there's a small chance this won't be quite right. The spell was for frogs. Nora bit her lip, but I'll do my best. The thought had crossed her mind, but Gretchen pushed away doubt. Nora was the superior spellcaster. If it had been the other way around, she might have turned Nora into a cockroach. Closing her eyes and holding her breath, she shuddered as Nora sprinkled the potion over her head and spoke a clear incantation. The space in between felt like the few times she'd travelled in a portal stone, being stretched, squished and pulled simultaneously. She was verging on panic as time dragged on longer than the almost instant frog transformation, but took a ragged gasp when she felt her feet, all four of them, hit the floor. Good grief, the booming voice came from above. A green mouse, and a funny-looking one at that. Those legs look a bit wonky. As Nora's gigantic finger loomed above Gretchen, she moved instinctively in a leap that carried her toward the bed. She scurried along the floor to the darkest recesses of shadow. A jumping mouse. Seems we've created a new species. Frog mouse or mouse frog, depending on which side seems most dominant. 
Gretchen's mind rang with panic. It seemed instinctual, begging her to run as far as she could, maybe find some cheese, or cheese with flies on it. She took what control she could of her urges, and twitched her nose to take stock. If she stayed much longer, Nora might have her on a board with pins stuck in appendages, so she made a break for it to the door and pressed herself to the floor as she squeezed through the crack. Two sets of boots remained fixed in front of her, thankfully pointing in the other direction. Taking a sharp right, she took off as fast as she could, keeping close to the wall. She tried to recall the path they'd taken when the guards had hauled them away, but being lugged around like a fresh kill had made sightseeing a little harder. She cursed herself for not asking Nora before she left. The hallways ahead were clear, and she'd put enough distance between her and the guards to feel a little safer from their stout boots. Deciding to take her back legs for a test drive, she launched forward into a leap that made her head spin. When her feet touched the ground, she sprang off again and quickly covered ground as she frog-hopped along. There was an intersection up ahead, and she slowed to a stop and shrank against the wall at the sound of footsteps at an intersecting path. "'This will be bad for business,' one voice muttered. "'He makes these decisions while fretting.' "'Quiet,' the other hissed. "'Perhaps the steward will talk him around.' Gretchen waited as the boots passed by and turned the way they'd come. If she could retrace her way to the throne room, she may catch the girl en route. After alternating hopping and scurrying for some time, she took another turn into a much breezier space and blinked as the potted palms and embroidered tapestries on the walls began looking familiar. Up ahead were a grand set of double doors which were now closed. Reckoning that they had dismissed the gallery while negotiations were taking place, Gretchen cast about for where the crowd could have dispersed to. Another opening on the far wall led out to a garden, and her now enhanced hearing told her there were a lot of people out there. With one last glance toward the closed door, she took off toward the garden with a prayer that she didn't get trampled before finding her target. Chapter 8 Bright silk slippers and flowing robes crowded the lush gardens in the courtyard. Gretchen's nose twitched as she looked down from the top of a window casing she'd scrambled to. Her allergies were not helping her sense of smell, and she fancied there were more than a few wizards lurking among the nobles and hangers-on of the royalty. She kept her eyes fixed, however, on the girl in a haze of purple, who was chatting idly with other ladies of the court. Deciding she'd rather get this over with before manifesting back into her own and unclothed body, she lapped into a garden bed and zipped past a pattern of colour, seeking the right dress to climb up. Narrowly avoiding a heeled boot, she caught sight of the woman's emerald green dress and deftly flew up a fold. Of course, I am devastated by my fiancé's condition, but I understand the concerns of the traders. I'm sure our king will come up with a solution to our predicament. Fiancé. She'd turned her fiancé into a frog. Gretchen escaped the lady's hand as she brushed it over her skirt and dropped into one of her pockets. She hoped for both their sakes she would leave the garden party early. The wedding is only postponed. I'm sure they will find a cure, and I will be with my future husband soon. If you'll excuse me? Gretchen swayed back and forth as the lady moved, and from the surrounding sounds diminishing, she realised that the woman had stepped into quieter quarters. She was feeling dizzy when the footsteps seemed to move upstairs, but her belly soured when she felt the lady's hand give her pocket a firm pat. Yes, I know you're there. It came as a whisper, and Gretchen was at least thankful she wouldn't have to confront her in front of others, unless she fed her to the dogs to shut her up. Gretchen heard a door shut behind them and braced herself. Fingers snaked into the pocket and took a firm hold on her tail as the lady lifted her out and dangled Gretchen in front of her nose. Now, what do we have here? The sneezy one or the one infamous for her curses? She pouted and dropped Gretchen on a lacquered table. Uncertain if she could will herself out of the enchantment, Gretchen closed her eyes and concentrated on the spell. It didn't seem to budge, and she gave an undignified squeak. The lady chuckled and stepped away from the table. When she returned, she waved a stone over her head and muttered an incantation. Gretchen's eyes bulged as she popped back into her usual body, finding herself laying prone on the table. The sneezy one, she clucked. I suppose you are here to uncover my crimes. 
Gretchen blinked at her surroundings and spotted a carved four-poster bed. She scrambled off the table and reefed a blanket from the covers to wrap around herself. Well, I don't turn up naked in another witch's bedroom for no good reason now, do I? She thrust her chin in the air. But if I wanted to snitch on you, I'd be in the throne room, wouldn't I? The name's Gretchen, by the way. You've no proof. The young woman poured wine into a goblet from a side table and took a sip. I am Sheena, the adoring fiancé of the prince himself. Why would I hex my future husband? Well, I could think of plenty of reasons, but I'm sure only women would relate, and the fairer sex don't seem to hold much clout in these parts. Gretchen tucked the blanket around her like a towel. But I've come here to beg that you undo the curse. There's a fine witch arrested in this palace on account of it. I see, she rolled her eyes. And why would I reveal myself to get a notorious sorceress off the hook? Gretchen's mouth hung agape. Because it's the right thing to do. Nora never harmed anyone, well, not terminally, and most of her hexes are annoyances at the most. Sheena waved a hand and dropped to a velvet upholstered chair. You witches on the mainland don't know how good you've got it. Open sorcery is out of the question on these shores. The witches of Sharon have had to practice the highest levels of discretion for generations. You call turning your lover boy into a frog discreet? Just turn him back. We'll say it was us, and we can put this whole business behind us. Her eyes flared. I will never marry that imbecile. Would have me wearing one of those necklaces for the rest of my days while pushing out strapping young wizards. They don't mind a witch if she's suitably muzzled around here if it means producing superior offspring. So they... no. Gretchen sank onto the bed. And they didn't suspect you. Who do you think planted the idea that it was a witch with connections to their trading partners? She crossed her legs and her eyes glittered. Gretchen held her eyes for a few moments, outrage replacing surprise. She would not let Nora go down for this, not without taking that ninny with her. I'll scream it from the rooftops. Even as they tie me to that stake, I'll let everyone know who was responsible for frogging their future king. When we're good and dead, the curse will still be there, and people will start whispering. It seemed to strike a nerve, and Sheena shifted in her seat. I want asylum. Asylum? Gretchen's mind raced. I suppose we could stow you away in the ship, but none of our leaders will want a part of this mess. Get me far away from this place with a means to take ship to the southern continent. She set her goblet down. I have a cousin who married into a wealthy family there, before they liberated their witch population. Gretchen recalled stories of bloody and magical civil war from those lands. It had every witch and wizard on this side of the sea squirming for months. I'm sure we can make that happen. But the curse. How was it done? A stolen kiss. Her lips twisted into a malevolent grin. Out in the gardens under the moonlight. He didn't seem to mind me shedding the necklace while I was unbuttoning my dress. Gretchen frowned as she recalled the night of scribbling in the library. A hex that imparted part of oneself. Dangerous magic and impossible to reverse without the cursor in question. So I'm guessing the remedy is something stupid then. Smooching him again, maybe? Sheena bridled at that and sat upright with a scowl. One of the most powerful curses to impart. None but the best could manage it. And I suppose you didn't think about what would happen if old Froggy-to-be got disemboweled by a passing raven? Gretchen let out a low whistle. I'd imagine that would be excruciating. She wasn't entirely sure that Sheena would be vulnerable to the prince's pain, but she wagered the other sorceress didn't either. Sheena's face drained and Gretchen fought the smirk on her lips. If witches had been living so far underground on this island for generations, it figured their knowledge was compromised. A few misspellings here, fragments there, and no spellbooks to keep them all catalogued. I'll get you out of here, but you need to go give that frog a big wet one. Gretchen stood and looked at the door, wondering at how she would get back unseen. Oh, let me, Sheena grumbled. Gretchen's eyes widened as Sheena waved the stone over her head and had no time to protest before shrinking into her frog-mousy form. With a squeak, she fled underneath the door and back out to the hallway. We need to what? Stuart glared down at Gretchen who was sitting on the narrow bed. Dark circles hung under his eyes and he carried himself with a rigid set that spoke of long hours closeted with the king. 
All she asks for is safe passage. The Baron can deny having anything to do with it. Just put her on a boat pointed at the southern continent, and this all goes away. How can we be sure she'll hold up her end? He folded his arms. Talk to her yourself. She wants out. I made it clear that my dying words will be of how she cursed her own fiancé. Gretchen's nose twitched, a hangover of the spell. We could make this happen, Nora interjected. Propose to undo the hex and say some mumbo-jumbo while she sneaks over to give him a peck. From there she'd have to sneak off, and we would smuggle her on the ship. Steward ran a hand along his balding pate, staring at a fixed spot on the wall. Is there any way to prove she did it? She's agreed to reverse it, Gretchen's eyes narrowed. She might not deserve to get off scot-free, but I won't condemn her to burn at the stake for trying to free herself from a gilded cage. Steward sighed and fixed Nora with a level stare. I'll seek her out first, then I'll arrange an audience with the king. After the door closed behind him, Nora turned to Gretchen with a worried frown. What if the king declines? His son is a frog, Gretchen huffed. He may say the curse will be lifted once we're put to the flame, but he can't be certain of it. All the big shot wizards around here couldn't get the job done. He won't admit it, but we're the best shot he has. Time dragged inside their cell, and Gretchen rode out the waves of nose twitching, her imagined tail flicking and her eyes snapping toward passing flies. Nora was strangely subdued, and she stared at the sky through the iron-laced window. Gretchen was starting to think she was wrong about the king, when the boots scuffled in front of the door. They both stood, ready for the performance to come. The guards marched them down the hallways toward the throne room, and Gretchen had to trot to keep from being dragged. She caught sight of Steward lingering by the door, and he gave a discreet nod as they passed. The guards dumped them unceremoniously in front of the throne, and Gretchen glanced around to spot Sheena. She stood beside the throne with her nose turned up in the air. She toyed absently with the armrest, her finger stroking her froggy fiancé. Too clever to send any kind of signal, Sheena avoided looking at them completely. The king stood towering over them from the top of the dais, except now she could see more worry than rage in his eyes. She can come no closer, he said, holding up a warning finger. Nora stopped short and held her hands up in supplication. I've been assured she can work her magic from a distance. Steward bowed low in a practised movement, and Gretchen wondered how much grovelling the man had done to get them this far. And if this doesn't work, I'll have the stake brought into this very room and she can burn where she stands. There was a mulish set to the king's jaw, and Gretchen worried that if they didn't get this done quickly, he may opt for the fire anyhow. Of course, your highness, Steward bowed and waved Gretchen and Nora to their feet. At a glare from the king, Gretchen shuffled a few steps back and did her best to look harmless as her eyes watered. She wagered if she sneezed again, he would make good on his threats to turn them both into barbecue. Nora lifted her arms and chanted insensible words, and Gretchen tried not to look at the throne. The king shared looks between his son and Nora, wringing his hands and shifting from one foot to another. The throne room was almost empty, and Sheena's feigned sobs echoed over the marble floors. Nora's voice got louder, and as she began turning in circles and swaying, the king's eyes remained on her long enough for Sheena to take her chance. Gretchen couldn't help but stare as she planted the prince with a firm kiss and back away from the throne, dropping into a melodramatic faint. Her ladies caught her by the elbows and whisked her away behind a silk curtain. His Highness the Frog bulged alarmingly and his green limbs lengthened in front of him. The king hissed and turned, but as he crossed the distance to his son, the curse erupted into green steam, leaving a befuddled prince sitting stark naked on the throne. Nora stepped back into Gretchen and turned with relief painted on her face. Get them out, the king's voice came in a strangled cry. I never want to see those vile creatures again. Gretchen wasn't about to argue, and by now the unclothed prince was lurching up from the throne with a murderous look on his face. She tugged on Nora's sleeve to sweep out of the throne room with Steward following close on their heels, pointing to a hallway to their left. I've arranged for her to be brought in a trunk to the ship, but we should be off before the king has time to think about an embargo again. The tides will be favourable in a few hours. Gretchen couldn't keep the big stupid grin off her face. A contingent of guards followed behind them, 
but stayed a respectable distance away. As they made their way through the city and onto the docks, she had a little spring in her step and relished the fresh sea breeze on her face. How about we do a little detour and stop by some other islands? Gretchen nudged Nora with her elbow. We have that cash from the toadstone and I could do with some sun tanning and drinks by the beach. Nora only gave her a level stare. What? Gretchen shrugged. It was just an idea, and I say we both deserve it. Think about it. Exotic food, culture, and I always wanted to get a gander at some dolphins. Did you know Aunt Esme had a spell that involved dolphin teeth that could levitate you off the floor? If I could get my hands on enough of them, I could throw my broom. Enough! Nora held up her hand. I'll be lucky enough to keep my position as it is, let alone get leave to go on vacation. Just a thought. Gretchen puffed out her cheeks. Rain check? Nora only nodded and stepped out onto the docks. Once aboard their ship, she leaned back against the railings looking shell-shocked. But when men in the Baron's livery hauled a large trunk on board, her head snapped toward it with a wicked glare. Now, now. Gretchen put a hand on her companion's shoulder. She got us off the hook. Oh, she'll get to the southern continent all right, Nora scowled. But she'll arrive with a rash on her face and warts on her backside. Thank you for joining me on this magical journey through A Royal Froggy Problem, episode three of the Gretchen's Misadventures series. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more whimsical readings and fantastical tales. Share your thoughts on this royal misadventure or recommend your favourite fantasy reads in the comments below. Your insights are the magic that keeps this community thriving. If you're ready for more of Gretchen's delightful escapades, give this video a thumbs up and hit the notification bell to stay updated on all things magical. Until our next adventure, may your books be filled with wonder and your days with magic. Happy reading!